Aloha. It's September the 30th. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. That can mean only one thing. It's Trump week. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And the title of today's show is Who Do You Owe $420 Million To? Tell us, please. But before we get into the discussion about Donald T Trump's tax returns, um, I've, I've got to talk about the debate or the so-called debate because it wasn't a debate. It was a rout. It was um, a disgusting portrayal of the denigration of the electoral process that we've been following since 1960, since the Nixon-Kennedy debates. Uh, our debating has been a, a, a strong, rich history of this United States and how we select a president to hear their views, their policies, and how they would run the country. And what we got yesterday was nothing but an obtrusive rant from the president of the United States, whose sole mission was to derail this debate, to make sure it didn't occur because Donald Trump didn't have one response, one answer to, to any of the hour and a half planned questions. So in order to address the questions that he could, could not answer, he wanted to derail it and he was successful. That was one of the purposes I believe um, that Donald Trump had in mind. And then other, the other purpose was to telegraph very clearly to the American public that he does not intend to accept the election results. He does not intend to accept the ballots as valid. And I guarantee you what he's going to do is say on election night, I am the winner and any, any votes beyond election night will be discounted, fought, disputed. And he even so much said that the courts will decide the determination of the election. So uh, Donald Trump had an agenda. It just didn't look like to the American public that he had an agenda. He flailed wildly in the air with insults and rants and interruptions. And some of them made their mark and some of them, most of them didn't. So let's talk about this. Uh, I wanna welcome our guests today. Uh, today we have Jay Fidel, Stephanie Dalton, Winston Welch, and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Morning, Tim. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, Jay, straight to you. Uh, this debate, the so-called debate, I've been watching debates since I was 10 years old, uh, really since 1968, and I've never seen a more disgusting portrayal of, of an, a president um, trying to participate in our democratic Electoral, electoral process, which is debates. Uh, your thoughts and observations from last night's debacle. Well, let me, let me spring forward on a point you made a minute ago. It was brilliant on, on Trump's part, brilliant. You know, when people came away with that was, uh, you know, one fellow was out of control and wild, the other fellow was trying to be a nice guy and talk to the people. That doesn't change any votes. We already know that. There was no, as the Times said, there was no information, no new information. Um, you know, that was a value there. What the spectacular was, was that he was displacing any civilized conversation. There was no civilized conversation. Now, what's, what's brilliant about that? He's, he's got a lot of things to apologize for. He's got a lot of questions to answer. He, he, he has not defended, not defended his, um, his, his finances as revealed by the New York Times and revealed a second time yesterday. <clears throat> they are after him with that. Uh, also, you know, although he is saying he's not going to not going to respect the vote, uh, mm -hmm. he's got all kinds of things working to mess up the uh, the process, mess it up before Election Day and after Election Day. He's busy with that. And I don't think he wanted to get into the details. Those are the things that happened behind his back. You know, for example, yesterday there was a story about the CDC and how he manipulated the CDC to the point where Redfield is threatening to resign. Um, over cruise ships, you know, terrible, terrible business behind his back. He doesn't want that coming out. Uh, he wants to distract us all. And indeed, isn't it clear? He totally distracted us. Well, it, Jay, is it a distraction to say that um, a refusal to renounce any white supremacist groups, be, be it the Boogaloo Boys or the Proud Boys or whatever, whatever group we want to we want to call them, is it a distraction for him to commit? to um, have them at the ready and have his supporters go to the polls on election day and monitor polls to make sure that the ballots are not being messed with. Didn't he basically uh, commit to voter intimidation by sending his loyal supporters out there to the polls 
And what, what kind of monitoring could they possibly perform? They're not trained to monitor. What is their role that he is, he's engaged them into and energized them to, to get out there on an election day and, and basically disrupt the electoral process, not help it. Also brilliant, also brilliant. But is that, that a distraction a or is that, a, is, that a, is, that a, is that a distraction or is that a promise? No, it's an activation. It's a dog whistle tell giving them instructions. Go out there, go out there by the thousands. Uh, you know, take your, um, you know, your, your assault rifles and stand outside, intimidate everyone. Uh, that's what he's doing. Um, so that was, you know, that was um, a, a direct instruction to a lot of his base to go and do that. So no, I agree with you, that's, that's not a distraction, that's an instruction. And, and I think it will happen. Aren't there election laws? I mean, if the average Joe basically went out, out into the streets or on a you know, megaphone or on a, some um, a social media broadcast and tried to incite uh, a disruption in the electoral voting process, wouldn't that person be, have a visit from some law enforcement agency and say, you, uh, you're not allowed to do that? Um, well, the answer is, uh, it is, it is uh, just to stand there is to achieve his result, just to be there, just to be looking like a, a, skin, a skinhead is enough, uh, and they'll be there, and they'll have that effect. As to whether a police officer is going to come and stop them, I don't think so. Um, you know, whether the police officer instructed to do that or inclined to do that is another question, but uh, who's going to do it? I, you want to make a citizen's arrest, Tim? Maybe I should send my wife and family. Maybe I should send my puppy. And they should make citizens arrest of people who interfere with voting by standing around with assault rifles. Um, I think it's going to happen. I don't think anybody's going to stop them. And I think it will have the intended effect. So it's a huge part of his agenda going forward. And he achieved that. Yeah, I agree. Hey, Stephanie, um, again, what I heard was a commitment to uh, disrupt the electoral process on election day. What I heard Donald Trump say is that um, all, basically most ballots are gonna be considered fraudulent and they'll be disputed. Um, what I heard Donald Trump say is uh, to the Proud Boys as a white supremacist group to stand back and stand by. That was a very clear instruction, even though today he once again, like he did with David Duke, denied who the Proud Boys were. He, didn't, he said he didn't know who that group was. Uh, another bold-faced lie that Donald Trump has uh, exposed to all of us. Uh, is there anything to be done about this, in your opinion? Is there any proactive thing that Democrats can do, law enforcement agencies can do, to head off at the pass a disruption on election night? Well, I, I think uh, you're so right, and it's so alarming. However, again, there are some things that can be done not uh, that are indirectly, hopefully, influential. But for one thing, why am I not hearing that every state that has a delay on counting ballots until Election Day, why am I not hearing that they're starting at 12.01 a.m.? So I'm not hearing that from all of those states. So they should have hordes of people in there counting those ballots the minute that clock strikes so that they've got you know another six, eight hours before the workday actually begins, giving us a little bit of a, perhaps a chance to get something done by that night, by what is it, 12 hours later. So I, I'm so disturbed by that that um, it, it's obviously um, making me nervous here. But the other point is that as far as going forward with these discussions, um, it, in my opinion, and I didn't have a stopwatch, but Trump had at least one third more time because he always came back after and, and stump, you know, went in over a Joe Biden sentences and started in on his rant. And Chris Wallace did not stop him. And that's when I was screaming at Chris on my TV, like, stop him, he's out of line. So it was at least a third, you know, a, a half of the time. In addition, he got half of Joe yeah. Biden. No, he, 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 he did that on purpose. And he knew that yeah. no one was gonna really effectively shut him up. So he continued to rant and interrupt and talk over so that Joe Biden could not get his points out. 
to make a point. He could not be coherent with this truck coming through his uh, his expression. So, so I mean, those are I, I'm suggesting kind of like not a huge, but too big, too little procedures that ought to be in place that uh, would yield a lot of time and perhaps uh, product and effect. I mean, yeah. I'm so concerned about the ballots being low and they will be low if they don't count, start counting them until 8 p.m. They're, they won't get 100 counted by midnight. So um, this, this is a factor um, that needs to be addressed. And then, of course, we'll see what the committee does for reestablishing the rules of, of the next uh, so-called debate. But I believe it is a uh, it is a town hall, and the next actual debate will be Kamala and the vice president. And so that should be more right. in line with vision. Okay, thank you very much, Stephanie. Say, Winston, um, what what were the highlights or the the bright points for Joe Biden last evening? I, I, you know that whole. Uh, the whole thing was a debacle. I, I, I felt I felt sorry for all of us as Americans, but I also felt sorry that that this man who spent his whole life in public service had to be degraded by being on the stage with this uh, this uh, this bully um, dictator wannabe. It was it was degrading for Joe Biden to have to be up there and be harassed and harangued and um, uh, degraded like he was. This was not a uh, an act, a debate in any sense. This was this was one man bullying, interrupting, cutting off 125 times. I think is what one um, organization counted. And it was, it if that doesn't provide the scariest example of if people vote for this man in any way or allow him to proceed, that's what we're we're, we're that's the best behavior we're going to get out of it. So that's him being on his best behavior on a stage, trying to make a case for another four years. Yeah, it was appalling. And Look, uh, if, if you're Joe Biden's campaign team and they've already agreed to have uh, other debates with Donald Trump, which I don't think they should have committed to that. But if you are on their campaign team and you're now going to be committed to the next debate, what what stipulations would you recommend that Joe Biden or what ground rules should the the moderator or the entire structure, the environmental structure of the debate what, what, what would that look like? What, what form should that take so that we don't have another disgusting portrayal of what we call democracy and have it completely sabotaged by a, a ranting and rave, uh, raving uh, president? I, I don't think he should do another debate. What's the, it's not a debate. What's the point of that? That's just showing children bad behavior in adults, uh, especially how to, how to bully and intimidate and harass another person. Yeah, so, I, I agree, but they committed to it, so it's going to happen. Then they so have to have timers uh, that that literally go off that are very strict, and that and microphones that shut off, and literally you don't get to talk unless there's a little red light on your days yeah. that allows you to talk. But I, I think that Rachel Maddow had it right that, that Donald Trump just destroyed another American institution as we understand it. But after he goes, let's come back in four years and see uh, how this is. But you know, I. There were so many falsehoods that, that and, and just childish behavior it was it was hard to to wrap your head around at the end of it. You just wanted to, to take a bath in. in, in and can I answer a little more on that question? What what can they do? What can the commission do now? Uh, of course, the microphone issue that's been discussed all around the block and that that should happen. And everybody should agree to that, including Trump. And then he has to he has to actually abide by it. But there's something else that just strikes me from our experience here at ThinkTech. Why do they have to be in the same room? Why can't they be in different places? Why can't they be on kind of a version of Zoom? Uh, 60 Minutes had an interview with David Attenborough last Sunday, and they had him in, in the UK, and uh, the interviewer was in the US, and it looked like they were in the same room. But in fact, they were using Zoom and doing it really well. And, and I think that could happen here too. And of course they could shut the sound off on one side or the other. Um, and the, you know, that whole intimidation feature, Winston was talking about it before, using your hands and hypnotizing people and all that gesticulation that Trump does, um, that could be you know, minimized. Uh, so, and, and Biden has agreed, okay, but Biden could also say, um, how about doing this on remote? That would be a good solution and he would be much better protected. Suggested, Jay, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. 
Yeah, because I, I, I think what he's done in one single night is really turn off the American public from watching future debates. And I think he, he successfully has, again, sabotaged an institution, an American tradition of listening to two candidates, one president, one, one would-be president, to debate the issues that they want to see the voters consider. And he's sabotaged that beautifully. And I, I, I don't know anyone who's looking forward to the next debate. I'm certainly not. And I, I love watching debates. So uh, I think Donald Trump, although he didn't win the night, he won the night. Um, I'm sorry, but um, are you all looking at Fox? That's not what they think. That's not what they say. Utterly, completely in contrast to that. So you yeah. see how with Zoom, I can still jump in. So I need somebody handling my mic. To keep okay. my mic. I'm going to turn your mic microphone off right now. No. Um, hey, Cynth excuse me, Cynthia, what, what were Joe Biden's uh, bright moments last evening when he finally got a chance to articulate some of his positions and, and some of his response to Donald Trump? Did you see any bright, bright uh, spots there for Joe Biden? I, I loved it when he made eye contact with the camera consistently throughout. I thought that was a really strong position for him. He didn't get a chance to really make- How did he do on COVID? How did he do on painting Donald Trump as responsible for uh, COVID and the, you know, the horrific 205,000 American deaths we now have? Did he hit any, um, any points there? I, I don't think so. I was not impressed by how much, there's so many things he could have said and, and he did well, partly because he didn't get a chance to and, and kept getting thrown off. But I think there's just a whole lot more that he could have said about the way Trump dropped the ball, the way he went about being exactly the opposite of what he told Bob Woodward. And he didn't do that. And so little things like, you know, he tried to blame him for all 200,000 deaths. He can't do that, really. It's a virus. But you can, you know, hold him responsible for the deaths that happen because of his inaction, specifically all of the medical personnel. And he sort of started to go that way, but then he was cut off by Trump. So really for me, the only one was when he looked in the camera and he said, don't listen to this guy. He, you know, don't fall for the lies that he's telling you. You have a chance to make a difference. Get out and vote. I was, as you know me, hashtag paper ballots, was completely just so mad about every pundit since, every pundit before, I mean, preparing for it and the afterwards. All, nobody's talking about paper ballots. So every single person that goes in to vote in person, electronically, might as well just not go. Because we know that he's got access to the tabulation software. So we know we can't trust what- Okay, so, okay. Um, after the debate, the instant polls started rolling in. And as far as who was declared a winner, I believe some of these, now this was CNN, but there was other polls, clearly showed Joe Biden at a 60 percentile and Donald Trump somewhere between 28 to 30 percentile as far as you know who, who really won the day on that, that debate. Um, does that matter anymore? Well, unless you listen to Fox, like Stephanie said, and, and same thing, not just because I listened to Fox for a while to see what they were saying. And they were just praising Trump all over the place. So all of the Trump people. That okay, got, so we're talking spin rooms. We're talking about in the spin room then. Oh, yeah, and then on, right. um, on all of like MSNBC Today and CNN both, I saw them interviewing uh both some, you know, Trump officials from his campaign, some, uh, some other, you know, Republicans, and everybody, at 201. And okay. they did the exact same thing that Trump did at the, at the debate, was yeah. just talk over the, you know, the well, journal. That's, that's, usually, that's usually the case after a debate. Everyone gets, they call it the spin room, of course. Um, so you different. see that. All I right, think, I gotta, I'm going to change subjects here because um, uh, Jay... Finally, after four plus years, we finally get the nature and the truth about Donald Trump's taxes. Uh, yeah. The New York Times has come out with their, their, their report on what the, his taxes look like. And to no one's surprise, 10 out of 15 years, 
Donald Trump paid zero taxes. And for the years 2016 and 2017, he paid a whopping $750, um, to no surprise. But um, he, he basically has destroyed the narrative that he was such a great businessman. But these tax returns reveal that it wasn't his businesses that um, was making him all his money. In fact, it's just the opposite. The businesses were creating huge losses. What saved the day for Donald Trump was his time and paychecks on The Apprentice. Uh, given the tax story from the New York Times, any revelations come to you, um, to your mind on that? Yeah, the, the Apprentice defines him. He's still doing it. That's the most successful part of his life. All other things have been a failure. But what I, what, you know, in a minute or two, let me tell you what I'm greatly concerned about uh, from those articles. And they're still coming. There'll be more. Uh, is that he owes uh, $400 million. He's, it's coming due next, next year. Uh, he's going to have to pay it or refinance it. Who does he owe it to exactly? Because sometimes these things follow a circuitous route. Um, we know that a lot of this money was lent to him offshore because American banks would not lend him any money. Um, and those banks may be connected with Vladimir. Vladimir could be funding those banks to fund Trump. And then he's got to roll it over. He's got to get new financing to cover it, or he'll be sued and he'll be in bankruptcy. Um, Clearly, he doesn't have the revenue to pay $421 million off by his existing revenue. He doesn't have it. So he's going to have to either sell off assets or create a new revenue stream. I'm not sure he has the assets. He's got well, he to golf courses and, you know. I'm not sure he has the assets. It's all subject to this debt, huge debt. And, um, you know, I think Putin is in there somewhere, but Putin, even if Putin isn't in there, that's a charitable way to look at it, Putin could be in there. So the question, as, as one intelligence guy said, is uh, who does he owe it to? Who is he beholden to? He's, he'd never get a security clearance. It's obvious that, that he's conflicted big time to those people who he owes the money to or those people will have to lend him more money to cover you know, the defaulting debt. What, what, what's happening here is he doesn't belong to us. He belongs to someone else. Um, well, this is really two very gross. quick stories is, um, you know, Donald Trump's um, Miss America pageants were big time money losers until it went to Moscow. And then an oligarch just started dumping and underwriting uh, um, millions of dollars into it where that's where Donald Trump finally had a successful year with the Miss America pageant. But uh, another example is he had a property down in Palm, Palm Beach, which wasn't selling. It, no one was making an offer on it because it was way overpriced. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, one investor comes in, not only pays the list price of the property, but $50 million on top of it without any competitive bids. So he just took the list price, plus here's $50 million, uh, Mr. Trump. And guess who that happened to be? A Russian oligarch. And of course, we know who the Russian oligarchs report to is Vladimir Putin. So we know that there has been uh, direct tie-ins to Donald Trump's finances and to Russia. And specifically, I think, to Vladimir Putin. Uh, do we have the right to know exactly who he has this indebtedness to? Should we know that regardless of whether we see another financial statement or not? You for bet. Security you purposes? totally bet about that. You're absolutely right about that. And what I thought was interesting is the day before the uh, debate, Biden and uh, Kamala Harris uh, revealed their tax returns. Good timing. Um, and showing that they paid, you know, oh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in tax, uh, where he pays 750 or zero. In any event, the, the American people, especially now and going forward, this will be, I think, a permanent change. We will have to know to whom the president owes, money or other favors. And, and hopefully before election be, day. Hopefully before election day. Absolutely. Uh, Stephanie, your thoughts about the uh, New York Times article. Um, we're starting to run out a little time, so um, I want to get through everybody. And so I'm curious to th uh, know what you think. I, well, first of all, now I know why the son-in-law and, um, and, and his daughter couldn't get clearances. I couldn't understand that. But obviously, we're learning about the financial backgrounds are just as important as whether they're spying for anybody. But anyway. Um, I wanted to say that as far as I've read, it's the Deutsche Bank who has who has given Donald his loans. Nobody else has been willing to finance him since his debacles 
of financial loss um, and, and bankruptcy uh, in Atlantic City. He just blew everything there and elsewhere. So it's only Deutsche Bank, and they're uh, under and, and review. Deutsche right. Bank was fined millions of dollars in fines with a direct leak of money laundering with Russia. Mm -hmm. Yes. So something is going, so this, th that's the only place he has to go. Now, can they cough up more to cover him on this? I think you're right, Tim. He needs to unload all the assets as, in, as, in, as far as they're worth. Maybe that includes Mar-a-Lago, God knows. But we'll see. I mean, but he's always pulling the genie out of the hat or the rabbit, I guess. is the way he gets up and it's a green rabbit. Well, so maybe it's the shell game analogy that we should be looking at more so than pulling a rabbit out of the hat is, is the old three card Monty uh, routine that he knows so well from being a New Yorker. Thank you, Stephanie. Hey, Winston, um, Ivanka <laughs> Trump got $20 million in the form of a consulting fee at the exact identical time she was considered an employee. I didn't know you can get a consulting fee and be an employee at the same time, but apparently in Donald Trump's world, you can be. Um, wouldn't a $20 million consulting fee be subject to FICA um, Social Security, Medicare, all the deductions that any other employee would have to have come out of their paycheck. Yet um, that doesn't seem to be the case with the $20 million. What, do, what are your thoughts about Ivanka and her $20 million and uh, just the whole tax debacle uh, report from the New York Times? Go ahead, you Winston. Know, uh, well, first of all, his base doesn't care. And like you said, either it shows that he's smart. So they'll just either dismiss it as our system is broken that allows this to happen and our Fuhrer is smart, right? And so that's what they're thinking. Our leader is smart and so he can get away with it and good for him. I think the more important uh, story yesterday was about the Proud Boys and saying, stand stand back and and and, uh, and wait, you know, and stand by. And, go, and, stand stand by. by. And, yeah. and these other things, I mean, there's so many things that happened this week. The tax thing, it doesn't make a difference. For well, OK, I, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to dispute that or I'm going to take issue with that, because if you're an American uh, construction worker, a nurse, um, hard working person that works their 40, 50 hours a week and has barely enough to have uh, any time uh, money left over and you pay your fair share taxes, is this going to rub you the wrong way that Donald Trump for years paid zero taxes and certainly in two years paid $750 when you're a when you're a uh, a restaurant server or a construction worker or a policeman and you've paid thousands of dollars in taxes, is this going to rub you the wrong way? No. With all of the revelations we've had about Donald Trump over the last four years, nothing makes a difference with them. So I would say no. Well, I think that New York Times has a, a good article that was a Trump Center warning. Let's take it seriously. Washington Post says the rice bag is burning. Um, if you want a, a good debrief of, uh, in a humorous way, Seth Meyers had a, a funny uh, takedown on a closer look. Uh, we had, uh, you know, some imp really important news this week that just is now like uh, the CDC director, I think uh, Jay was mentioning that, that says that his, uh, you know, Scott Atlas, everything that he says is false. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I don't think it will matter going in. I think that just emboldened people and he was blowing the dog whistle for the ones that wanted to hear it. The people that saw his behavior just said, good, we have a strong leader in there and it won't make a difference. But I would, I would love to be wrong in that and, uh, and that it would resonate with people and say, you know what, he probably should pay a little bit more than 750 bucks to keep the government functioning. Yeah, yeah. okay, thank you so much, Winston. All right, lightning round for you, Cynthia. Um, Christopher Ray, FBI director, has come out and explicitly stated there is no fraudulent proof that mail-in ballots uh, are, are defective. He came out and said it. He spoke truth to power, just like uh, Re Dr. Renfield said. You know, masses are important. It's the most effective way to keep uh, COVID from spreading. Um, Furthermore, that children can be affected by COVID-19. So you have two people who have come out and really put their necks on the line. Are they going to keep their jobs? Is Donald Trump going to get rid of them before the election? Well, if he doesn't get rid of them, he will discredit them in profound ways, you know, I believe. To speak to the taxes really quick, I got to say, I live on just under 20000 a year, a year. Okay, exactly. That's about 1500 bucks a month, max, okay? Um, 
at the end of that year, because a thousand dollars a month is um, unearned income is what they call it because it's alimony. I pay $500 a year in taxes because of that. And so, so when I saw him, you know, with this 750 a month, a year, and I thought, ah, I, I literally lost my mind a little bit as the numbers started to sort of clinch in my brain. I really was on my feet screaming at the television. Okay, and so, so it affected you adversely. One last thing I have to say, because I think it's really cool. Uh, Sean Carter is quoted as saying, a wise man told me, don't argue with fools because from a distance, no one can tell who's who. <laughs> as far as the debates go, right. well, you get the last a good blanket statement. <laughs> you get the last clever statement of the, uh, of the show today. So uh, <laughs> we've run out of time. And unfortunately, I, I, I wanted to talk so much more about um, all the topics that we discussed today, but 28 minutes goes very quickly. I want to say thank you to everyone. Jay Fidel, Stephanie Dalton, Winston Welch, and Cynthia Lee Sinclair, thank you so much. Join us next week, 11 o'clock, Wednesday. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Aloha.